Today I want to talk to you about DIY Christian. You know what that means? Do it yourself. And notice the symbol. No such thing as a DIY Christian. No such thing. We could think that we're doing what we ought to do, but it's impossible without the reality of the power of God and his spirit within us. Is that true or not? That's true, right? That's true. Before we get into the message today, I just want to bring about some uh, important intros, okay? I think about this in my life. When you really love the Lord, all you want to do is to please him. Is that true? Man, when you love God because you know you've been touched by his love, you've been saved, he's faithful as we've been worshiping about and talking about and sharing that reality of God's faithfulness in our lives, all we want to do is love him back. And we love him back by pleasing him. Now, we want to make a distinction that we understand and realize you don't want to please Jesus so he will love you, but rather you want to please Jesus because you already know he loves you. And that's a very critical distinction. But if you're anything like me, you get so frustrated when you displease God. <laughs> I mean, it really bugs you. It bothers you. And in our Wednesday night group, we've been talking about that in different ways. We almost shut down because we say, is God going to love me? Is he going to listen to me because I failed him? I sinned against him. But we know that for each one of us as Christians, there's kind of what I call the blip in life. You know, that skip in life or getting over that hump in life that it seems to sometimes repeat itself. And I just ask the question of myself and I ask you to ask yourself or tell you to ask yourself, what is the thing that snags you in life? What snags you? What trips you up? Are you unloving? Sometimes are you unkind? Are you jealous? Are you a gossiper? Are you struggling with any type of lust? And we know that lust has many different forms. You could lust after things. You lust after people. But we know it's sin. Do you struggle with lying, with telling the truth? Do you struggle with fear? Do you struggle that with the blip of anger in your life? That's for you to answer. But my point in this kind of intro is I believe that a prevalent blip for many today in the circumstances in which we are facing is fear. It's fear. We are being bombarded by fear. And there's a reason for it. And it boils down to the issue of control. If the enemy can use the government, if he can use the news and the media, if he can use other people to cause us to fear because we're choosing to fear, we need to understand something. Then we are being defeated. Because the Lord tells us clearly what? Not to fear. And fear is a sin. So I leave you with this. Why is our government wanting us to fear? Well, it's happening for a reason. And that reason is that we are in the setting stages of the tribulation period. That time that the enemy's power is going to be unleashed specifically through one person. And we know him as the Antichrist. And he is going to control not just the United States, but the entire world. He's going to call the shots. So it's hard to understand, but it's true. 
And we do believe, as an Assemblies of God church, we believe that Jesus is going to come and take us out of this world before that tribulation period. He's coming. He's taking you out if you're a true believer. And I'm looking up, like Scripture says. Look up because your redemption is close. And then during that time of tribulation, there's going to be total control over the entire world by a one world leader. So I just want to say to you today, understand that. We could talk about it, Lord willing, in the future a little bit more in detail. But don't allow fear to dominate your life. We cannot allow that to happen. Let's remind ourselves of what it says in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us, read it out loud with me. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline or a sound mind. Amen, amen. We have to realize that you cannot have faith and fear living together. It will be one or the other that's going to win out. Okay? Okay. All right, let's put our nose in Scripture. Romans 8, verse 1. So now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I got a wow, got a hallelujah. How about a little rah, rah, rah? Isn't that awesome? So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There's a few things we could really suck out of this one verse of Scripture. We cannot receive salvation through following or obeying the law. The law does not have the power to condemn us anymore as believers. And I know that you thank God for these truths, even as I do. But here's what's very important, very critical. We are not only free from sin's guilt, get this, but we are free from sin's power to make us its slave. Mm. Whoa! Because Jesus says, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. And the reason why he says that is that if we have not experienced the power of God in our lives to understand and walk in this truth, not only have we been forgiven and we don't have to feel guilty because of sin, but we are free from sin's power to keep us as slaves. And I know that some of you would definitely agree with me that as much as what I said is truth, sometimes we struggle with it at that moment of failure and sin. Wednesday nights have been awesome, as I said, in my little promo portion. It's been probably one of the most important, if not the most important thing we've done in this body, is to get back to the Bible stick our nose in the Bible, ask ourselves some very important questions based upon what we know and yet compare it to what the Bible says. What's true? Awesome. And one of the things we talked about just recently is we talked about the gift of justification. Be made right with God because of what he's done for us through Christ. Like I said, Jesus paid the price for our sin. But you can't unhinge that from sanctification. 
if you've been justified, then it is connected to sanctification, meaning that we are being separated from this world and we are drawing closer and closer to God. This is what one of the old timers said about this principle, John Calvin, back in the 1500s. He said this about justification and sanctification. Look what it says. As Christ cannot be divided, so also these two blessings which we receive together in him are also inseparable. You don't just say, oh, God, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, God. No, 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 no. If you've really been justified, you understand the truth and the principle of being sanctified. And Paul is saying here, in essence, when we are truly in Christ, then the guilt of our sins have been removed by his death, but we don't stop there. We experience the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit that is now dominating our lives rather than the sinful, but the sanctifying power of God's dominating our lives, and therefore there is no condemnation. Does that make sense? Justification, sanctification, becoming more and more holy, growing in holiness, growing away from the world, from myself, my flesh, and growing to be Come more like Jesus. Great truth. And look at verse 2. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit, here it is, has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body, like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control. Oh, don't you love it? Woo! Highlight it. Put stars on it. Do whatever. He declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Again, again, in essence, God has given us everything we need so that we can live the Christian life and we can overcome this old flesh. This is called the robe of flesh, and it's yucky. Can be very yucky, right? And this concurs with Scripture that is in 1 Peter. We've said this over and over again. Peter says this, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for what? Living a godly life. We have received everything. All of this by coming to know him. Isn't that great stuff? God's power. By God's power, he's given us everything we need. Do you believe Jesus took all of your sins upon himself? You believe that? But do you also believe and understand that Jesus did something else? He took our old self and he crucified it with himself on the cross. In other words, Jesus did something we could not do. We don't become sinners because of the sins we commit. We commit sin because we are sinners. Sin is the root and sins are the fruit. Ooh. Ooh. A bell went off for somebody. We know we've all been born in sin, 
right? The Bible says, for all have sinned, fall short of God's perfection. And no one in this room had to teach your little baby angel how to sin. All of you, baby, they get older. That divine angel doesn't take you too long that, to realize that little baby angel could have a little devil living inside of it. Right? Nobody has to teach a child, a human being, to do evil. It's inherent. It's inherent. Sin. How many times have we said that? What's the middle letter in sin? Oh, come on, say it with conviction. <laughs> I, I. In that one letter, we see the reason for all the problems in the world today. And more specifically, we see the problems in our own lives because of that one letter. Everybody's demanding their own way. Everybody says, I have my rights, including married couples. But what makes marriages go bad? The problem is my will. The problem is me. The problem is I. You say, Pastor, is that true all the time? Hmm. Think about that. Just think about that for a while. But that's at the root of so many unhappy marriages. It's I. It's me. It's my will. But Jesus not only came to give us and offer us salvation, but also to know how to deal with this problem. You say, what's the problem? If you didn't pick up on it yet, it's self-centered living. That's the problem. We talk about victory. But how about understanding that Jesus gave us the victory over the self-will? by dying to the whole principle of self-centered living. And of course, he is our perfect example. And that example specifically was found in Philipp is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I'll read it real quickly. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Think about that the next time you want to challenge your wife or your husband. Yo, what's up? I do my part. What about you? Come on, right? We always want to hold on and say, look, you look at this and you measure it out and this is the way it should go. This is the right thing. God says, just, just die to your self-will. <sighs> Do we realize how hard that is? But Jesus took to the cross a nature that never sinned, his own. And that is how he condemned sin in the flesh. Yeah. You see, when someone, maybe you're in this room, you've never repented of your sin, never said enough. I'm not going my way anymore because I know all that's going to do is lead me to hell. But I realize that God does love me and God gave his son Jesus to come and to take my sin upon himself. And when I believe that in faith, that's the truth. There is the greatest miracle that can happen, and that is a, he comes to live inside of you by the Holy Spirit, through the person of the Holy Spirit, and you are a new creation. A new creation. And all you have to do is agree with God about that and come to him, and you're changed. In verse 4, it says again, he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer, no longer, what's those two words? No longer, what's that again? No longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. 
Do we get it? This is exciting. But we must realize that the work of the Holy Spirit needs to be continual and constant at work in us. If it was up to me, it would be sin is always irresistible. You can't resist sin. It is continually irresistible. But the difference is the power of the Holy Spirit in me guarantees that I can experience a continuing crucifixion of the old self. When that thing, like I said, it's like a blip. It just grabs you, grabs you. you got to shake it off. And you shake it off through the power of, the, of God in you. You want to be greedy? Shake it off. Your TV's two years old. It's enough. You had an, you've got to get a new one. Because consumerism says you need a new one. Your car, hey, this rattle trap, it's five years old. You got to get a new one. You got to shake that stuff off. You have to. Otherwise, you're giving in to me. I, I, I. You see, that's. The song that I wrote many years ago, I, 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 no, that wasn't me. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's about me. It's about my rights. It's about my desires. It's about, I love my wife, but she has to understand. Yeah, right? Oh, I love my brother in the Lord, but, you know, I got to set him straight. Got to set her straight. Wow. Let me put it to you this way. You ready for this? Not on the screen. The working of God's power in my life will be in direct proportion to me submitting my will to him. You want to know God's power? You better die and die and die. You better submit your will to God, the very things we're talking about. Because the more I submit to the Lord the more of his power I'm going to see at work in my life. This makes me want to do a holy something. <laughs> Give me a hanky, somebody. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> you did that once before, I think. It's so true. I'm the pastor, right? I said, God, I want power in my life. I want power in my family. I want power in your church. God goes, good. Die to yourself. No, it's the wrong answer. That can't be right. And of course, I never even sensed that I need to die because that's how proud, that's one of my problems. I don't need to die. I don't need to give this up. I share with you, I think a week or two ago, my, my son was just so kind and giving me all these accolades and I just like, <laughs> I go, son, son, he goes, dad, I know, I know, I know, I know, because you realize it, you know, you're this and that. And I said, but son, I just, Jesus, it's Jesus, Jesus, nothing, 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 good in me. Wow. So true. I can never say that I'm dead to sin. Does that shock you? But I can say and should say that I am dead to sin in Christ. In Christ. Because he already put it on that cross. One of the hardest things I needed to learn and still need to be reminded of is this. I need to continually be delivered by the Holy Spirit from my self-will. I need that every day of my life. If there's any strength that I could possibly find, it's when I implement this truth. If I do this, I'm strong. If I don't, I'm weak, and I'm trying to be a DIY Christian. I need that. It's ongoing. It's progressive. And that's why I need to grow in the character of Christ. That is why I need to allow the Holy Spirit to control my life more and more. 
You know, I could wake up one day and say, wow, this beautiful day. Thank God. Wow, nice. Thank God the heat's working. Thank God my bed is comfy. Thank God I'm off today, whatever it is. But if I stop there, I'm in big trouble. Big trouble. Because every day of my life must be submitted to the control of the Holy Spirit. And if I don't realize it, and worse than that, if I don't do it, I open myself to a horrible surprise sometime in that day because the power of the flesh is going to show up. So I surrender my will to God every day. Did you hear that? Every day. And not just a give you a big word, perfunctory prayer. Not just a prayer that I know I need to pray, but really sincerely saying to God, God, there's nothing good in me except you. Just show up in my life today. When I'm tempted, show up. When I'm challenged, show up. Look what it says in Romans 6, 13. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves. What's those two words? Give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Make no mistake about it. If you stop submitting to God, he stops working. The way you say you want him to work. Because you love Jesus. I love Jesus. But if I stop submitting, I'm not going to know that power in my life. This is true. But if you don't resist his spirit from working in you, guess what? He's going to free you from that thing that wants to grab you, <laughs> wants to <laughs> manipulate you. So what could possibly keep me away from such a great deal? That's like, this is not like this, this, the car salesman. Boy, do I have a great deal for you today. No, this is God Almighty saying, look at the deal I have for you. And the, I come up with this thing. The only thing that stops me is me, my rebellion to God's truth, because he wants to show up in my life, and then I end up just fighting God. Could you imagine? I'm actually fighting God. Why? Because I don't want to give up my self-will. I don't want to let go. I want my, my rights, of course. I want to hold on, of course. I'm your husband. I'm your pastor. I'm this, I'm that. And in this whole area of accountability, oops, I said it again. I said I wasn't going to use that word. It's just this thing that we do not get out of the box of realizing that God says, look what I have for you. I have brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so to help you. And we never avail ourselves to them, really. We don't take the time to know them, really, and them to know us, really. It's just brother and sister every week. I'm going out. I'm on video this week. Some people go, what happened? What happened to the video? I said, we didn't have it. But I'm going out of the video. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Oh, brother, sister. Hey, man, how's everything? Good, good. Praying for the Eagles today. Better, you better pray, pray, pray. <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's it. That's it. That's it. God says, look what I have for you. And some of us have been in the Lord a hundred years, and we still don't take advantage of the blessing of having someone for our lives that we can confess our sins to and say, man, pray for me, I'll pray for you, and walk together and say, by the way, 
you've been a husband this long in the Lord. What do you think about this that I do, you know, regarding my family, my, my wife and relationships? And we're just so, we're just like shut in. We're just like boxed in. What is that? It's self-will. Wake up. Wake up. It's your problem. It's your, you're suffering from it. Your children are suffering from it. And the body's suffering it from it because you don't just take the time to see the blessings that God has in someone else or through someone else. So we're acting like DIY Christians at that point. No bueno. Because now we're trying to live in our strength. And the moment I fight for victory is the moment I'm headed for defeat. That's what I'm finding out. And I've been in the Lord a pretty long time. Fighting in my own strength. And really, wait a minute. God's not out to improve me. His design has always been that his will would replace my will any given day. And it should be every day, every moment. So every time I'm tempted, I'm responsible to tell the Lord, Lord, I can't handle it. I'm responsible to say, not to say, oh, this doesn't bother me. You dope. How stupid can you be? How stupid can I be? Oh, no, that was a problem in my life. No, I can't handle it. Lord, I need to say, Lord, this is what you came to die and save me from. I give it over to you. I give it over to the power of your spirit to carry out the death sentence and produce your life in me. I need you, God. <laughs> Don't forget, Jesus is the opposite of all that we are. Remember last week, compassionate? I'm not compassionate. In myself, no way. Approachable. Jesus was always approachable. I don't want to be bothered. Unselfish? Ooh, we could have a month of sermons on that. It's so selfish. We talk about forgiving? Uh, let them just hang in there for a while. We'll see if they really mean it. Humble? Ugh. Again, the stench of pride in our lives, it comes in so many different forms, and pastors struggle with it too. And then patience, I'm not touching that one. Don't ever forget that anything good in any of us is because of Jesus. Don't forget it. When we place our lives in his hands and give him control, then guess what he does? He intervenes to sanctify us and deliver us. There's no such thing as the self-life and the Christ life peacefully living together. Never happens. It's like faith and fear. Either faith's going to prevail or fear is going to prevail. So it boils down to this big question. How badly do you want all that God has for you? How badly do you want it? How badly do you want, since we started this way, how badly you want fear to let go of your life? How badly do you want whatever, you fill in the blank or the blanks? How badly do you want that out? Because it is truly a blip in your life. You need to submit to Jesus. You need to allow him to have full control of your life because guess what? All God requires of us is to be honest and sincere and then his part is to make you strong. That's all he's asking for. Philippians 2.13, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Come on. That's true or not true? And if God, you say, well, God is not working in me, that means you're holding on. You're holding on. 
How many people you think you have to ask to prove to you you're holding on? Well, the point is you don't ask anybody. Some don't even ask their spouses. They don't ask their children. I've said that for how many years in this church? Did you like that on video? Years. In this church, we don't bother to ask. Romans 6.11, so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. So it reminds me, the very same faith that saved me will cause me to get over the hump in my life. But it takes an act of commitment and surrender. By faith, I give myself over to God's control. When you do that, you won't be ruled by sin. It won't be a master over you. I close at Romans 6, 14. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. It goes back to, or goes up to Romans 8, 1. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Yes, yes, yes. Let's pray. We need to pray. God, thank you.